Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our sixth UNFPA and Global Media Campaign webinar series on FGM and COVID. FGM under COVID, rather. It promises to be insightful and highly informative. Co-hosting with me today is Ayo Bello, one of the leading young, who is one of the young, one of the leading young FGM campaigners in Nigeria. Ayo, why don't you come in and greet everybody? Hello everyone. I'm so happy to be here today. My name is Ayo Bello, as Naima said. Um, I'm so happy about this um, webinar, maybe because it's a youth special webinar, so I'm so excited to be here. And um, thank you very much for joining in. Um, I, at the end of the webinar, we'll be giving you some forms to fill, survey forms. So please kindly fill in them so that um, we can get your feedbacks and try to get better. So we have lots of um, panelists joining us today. It's going to be very insightful and you know, educative and there, there's going to be lots of energy because um, as young people, we have lots of energy. So we're doing lots of um, storytelling and also we are here to answer your questions. So I think you should start typing them down. Um, as soon as you have them available, because we have just about one hour, but I, I'm very sure it's really going to be fun. So we have about five um, young um, activists from Nigeria, Kenya, Sierra Leone, and the Gambia. So um, I, I, I'm very sure that it's going to be powerful. So I think we have Ayo Tomiwa from Nigeria, while we wait for others. Mm -hmm. Ayo, how are you? Thank you. I'm fine, thank you. Hello, everyone. So glad to be here. Hi, nice. Ayo. I'm very fine. I'm very fine. I'm, I'm very, very fine. Um, can you please just um, introduce yourself, tell us your name, your location, and why you think it is important to end female genital mutilation? Okay, my name is Ayo Tomiwa Ayo Dili, and I'm based in Ekiti State, Nigeria. I'm a media person as well as a civil society advocate because I see what FGM does to the girl's child, and that's why I decided to add my voice to it. It has so many negative impacts, starting from the long term and short term to the long term and um, the health implication, the traumatic part, the psychological part. So this is why I decided that I have to join this race and ensure that we put an end to FGM. And unfortunately, my state is um, one of the states with high prevalence rates in Nigeria. That's the key to state. We are number two in Nigeria, according to the UNFPA UNICEF statistics of 2015. So it shows that we still have a lot to do and um, so many efforts have been ongoing. But then, it's being a That's young person, I'm sure we need to put in our energy. That's why I'm on board. Yes, and I'm, I'm glad you're there. I think that's one fortunate thing happening to AKT State, the fact that they have activists like you. So well, I'm glad to be you. part of the state. Thank yes. you. Mohammed, how are you? Okay. <laughs> Mohammed, we have one Mohammed. Mohammed is one of the panelists from Sierra Leone. Mohammed, how are you? Can you hear us? Mohammed, I know you can hear me. Can you hear us? Yeah. How are you? Yeah, I can hear you. I'm fine. So kindly introduce yourself. Some people are meeting you for the first time. Tell us your name, your location, and why you think it is important to end female genital mutilation. Um, I am Mohammed Adam Jr. Kamar. I am a journalist advocate who has been part of um, the end of FGM for five years ago since I started my world of activism with journalism as well. I have worked for, um, I am currently working for the Sierra Broadcasting Corporation, one of the country's leading broadcasting house in Sierra Leone. And I believe that as a journalist, my voice, my pen and everything is useful to have this in your practice of female genital mutilation we put to hopes, especially when it is eminent in the area that I'm living in this part of the country in Sierra Leone. Uh, that is um, Tonko Lilo District, northern part of Sierra Leone, where I am presently um, living. And of course, I represent the team Tonko Lili, one of the media graduate um, teams um, which was trained by the 
um, global media campaign, GMC, sometimes it go. And I am a graduate from that particular academy. And um, I work as a media graduate, has been so eminent, crossing parts of Sierra Leone, you know, with the end of FGM. I have on the two club of activities, you know, rescuing girls from being manipulated and cheated into bundle bush and all those things. Um, Thank you, Mohammed. I, I, there's a lot of opportunity to, to share everything that you've been doing. Uh, we have a lot of time. Kindly, if we can give two minutes introductions for every all the panelists, because we okay. have a lot to unpack. We only have an hour, so let's let's keep the energy and zest alive. So let's move on to the next uh, panelist, Io. Yes. Thank you. Okay. So um, let's have Domitla. Domitla. Domitla, are you there? Uh, maybe to crown it all. Ayo. Mohammed, definitely, just like Naima said, we have lots of time. We have lots of questions. Right. I'm sure some Thank questions you. are coming in already. So don't worry. We are going to hear you. Your internet is going to be perfect. Your sound will be perfect. So don't worry. <laughs> Domitla, how are you? I'm fine. Thank you. How are I you all? I'm from Kenya. Good to see you. <laughs> Good to see you all. Yes. So, um, so many people are just meeting you for the first time. So kindly introduce yourself. Tell us your location and why you think it's important to end female genital mutilation in two minutes. Thank you so much. First of all, I'm so excited to be taking part in this uh, youth uh, NDGM um, webinar. Uh, my name is Domtila Chesan. I'm from Kenya, a community called uh, Pokot. I come from a place called West Pokot County, which is so far, far away from the city. Uh, I am an anti-FGM campaigner. Uh, I use media and other different platforms to voice out injustice method on the culture in my community. Uh, it's very important for me uh, to end FGM. I hold this issue so de dear to my heart because I live in this community. Uh, the girls who are being cut are my sisters and every woman around me who is older than myself, most of them have had FGM and have witnessed first and experiences and the consequences of FGM. So I'm doing everything possible to make sure that the practice comes to an end. So let's do this. Very good. <laughs> good to hear from you. Well done, Domitla. So let's move to the Gambia. We have Awa from the Gambia. Hi, Awa, are you there? Hi. Hi, Ayo. Turn on your video. Let's see your face. Um, I think the host has to. Um, okay. There we are. Wow. <laughs> Hi, Ayo. How are you? <laughs> I'm fine, thank you. Yeah, so we have lots of people watching you right now. So many people are tuned in watching us. So kindly introduce yourself, tell us your location and why you think it's important to end female genital mutilation. In two yes, minutes. Thank you very much. Yes, of course. Thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. My name is Awagai. I'm 21 from the Gambia. Um, I've been working with Safe Hands for Girls for the past four years to campaign against female genital mutilation. It's a practice that I believe is very much harmful for both women and girls. And um, I believe if young people come together, we can end FGM in a generation. That is a belief I have, and it is something that I always say that with collective efforts, in as much as it is really very difficult, considering the backlashes from religious aspects and traditional aspects, it is something that we can really, really um, fight against. And um, I think it is very, very much important to fight against female genital mutilation because it has a lot of consequences on the life of women and girls and it reduces their potential to be able to do uh, most of the things that they want to do and because of that i believe we need to end fgm wow that's interesting lots of energy coming from the gambia wow yeah. well done hi jeremiah uh, hi how are you let's see your face um all right All right. Okay. My name is Jeremiah Kipainoi. I am uh, from Kenya. I'm from the Mass. We know we can see from your outfit <laughs> you're from Kenya. <laughs> so, yeah, so nice to meet you. Good to see your face. I mean, so many people have been hearing Jeremiah, Jeremiah. So, and some people are meeting you for the first time. So, kindly tell us, introduce yourself, your location, and why you think it's important to end female genital mutilation. All right. My name is Jeremiah Kipainoi. I am. Um, an activist. 
uh, born, raised, and bred here in Kenya. I'm from the Maasai community, which is basically found um, in the southern part of the country, bordering Tanzania. So I have been in this campaign for quite some time, and I use the media as a tool for social change, basically. I'm passionate about ending FGM because I believe that um, if the girls are given an opportunity uh, to explore their full potential, then the community will have a bigger potential in regards to economic as well as um, social good in the long run. So, yeah. Wow, thank you very much, Jeremiah. So um, this, this is interesting already because you have lots of intimidating and very impressive introduction and profile. So if you're just joining us, our panelists just introduced themselves. They are young activists, you know, working in Kenya, the Gambia, Nigeria, and Sierra Leone. So they've done their introductions in case you're just meeting us. So if you have your questions, you can send them in the chat box. They are here. They've got lots of experience and they're here for you to entertain as many questions as we can take. So if you're just joining us, my name is Ayobelo, like I mentioned at the opening, and I'm co-hosting with my boss and inspiration, Naima Hassan. So I'll be handing over to her now. Thank you. That was lovely words there, Ayo. Thank you for that. And thank you for the, uh, you know, for holding this platform with me and, and co-hosting with me. So just to remind everyone why we are all here, 200 million girls have been subjected to a form of FGM in 30 countries. And in some communities, as you heard from our, co uh, from our panelists there, some girls are cut um, from infancy. Uh, whereas in other communities, girls are cut uh, from teenage and some even older than that. And women and girls that survive FGM tend to experience long lists of lifelong physical and, uh, and psychological traumas. And according to recent UNFPA report, a further 2 million girls are at risk of FGM due to the COVID pandemic. And a recent U United Nations World Population Prospect report says 19 out of the world's 20 youngest countries are in Africa. So young people present both challenges and opportunities to the African continent. And today we'll focus on the opportunities of young Africans bring to their communities, particularly when it comes to ch challenging and changing social norms uh, with practices like female genital mutilation. So we'll now watch a short film uh, about two amazing campaigners and their drive to change uh, social norms in their communities. The film then will be followed by a hearty debates and discussions uh, in the form of Q&A led by Ayo. So as Ayo said earlier, please uh, come ready with your questions and um, please post them in the chat boxes. And we'll take the opportunity to also remind everybody that there will be a survey uh, that will be posted in the chat boxes. Please um, share your thoughts on how we can improve these webinars. These are opportunities for all of us to learn. So we are trying our best to make it as, as easy and as accessible as possible to everybody. So without further ado, I'm just gonna stop talking now. We will play a short film and then we'll hand the floor to Ayo to ask our panelists some questions. Thank you. My name is Jeremiah Kipainoi and I am 27 years old. Seven out of every 10 girls and women have been cut in Hmong community. It is almost 80%. So it's quite a high number. Bonjour tout le monde, je m'appelle Hadi Idris Saba, j'ai 20 ans. Je suis la présidente fondatrice d'une association qui lutte contre les mutilations génitales. Excisée à l'âge de 8 ans, déjà à 13 ans, on me donne un mariage forcé. Et à 15 ans, je suis mère de deux enfants. Et c'est pour cette raison que j'ai commencé à militer depuis que j'avais 12 ans. Et à 16 ans, on a fondé cette association. En 2016, à l'âge de 16 ans, j'ai décidé de créer une association uniquement des filles parce que c'est un sujet qui nous concerne, nous les filles. Nous les jeunes, on s'est réveillés et on a repris notre destin à main. Et on a dit qu'on en a marre de ces violences-là. Nous sommes nés dans ces violences et nous ne laisserons pas la future génération naître dans ces violences. Young people have started getting involved in this campaign. I'll give you a small story. I met a little girl. She had just completed her high school. She was there speaking to the old men. I still remember that day very vividly, how the men reacted to what the girl was saying and the girl just speaking frankly without fearing that the men might chase her away. If girls now have an opportunity to speak to men who would not give them a chance ever, then we have hope. 
la communauté tient à cette pratique et de voir des jeunes, surtout des plus jeunes comme nous, parler de ce sujet, c'est un manque de respect pour eux. Les jeunes, réveillons-nous, qu'on nous qualifie de rebelles, qu'on nous qualifie de révoltés, qu'on nous qualifie de tout. Mettons-nous à la place de ces bébés qui sont en train d'être mutilés parce qu'on viole nos corps. With schools, we are able to reach children who really would not have seen beyond a certain age. The fact that they have not seen other children go past that level, especially girls, giving them alternatives of how far they can go. So working with schools is very important. des soutiens médiatiques, il n'y avait pas beaucoup de personnes qui nous connaissaient. Donc c'est à partir du moment où j'ai organisé une manifestation. La mutilation génitale, le mariage précoce, la violence domestique. La viol... Et ce jour-là, les militaires ont commencé à nous, à nous barrer la route et nous ont jeté du gaz lacrymogène. J'ai fait une vidéo pour dénoncer cela et c'est parti sur les réseaux. Quand les, les jeunes filles comme nous, les jeunes filles qui ont moins de 20 ans, sortent dans la rue pour réclamer, on doit nous écouter et on doit nous dire Qu'est-ce qu'on doit faire Et paf, les médias ont commencé à nous inviter sur le plateau. J'avoue vraiment, le combat a été mis sur la lumière et c'est parti euh, avec un bon. Les médias euh, jouent un rôle très important dans cette lutte. Ça nous permet de sensibiliser, ça nous permet de toucher un plus grand monde et ça nous permet de montrer jusqu'à quel point vraiment le sujet est une urgence. Initially, I just saw media as a tool to channel what others have said, but not really to use it as a way of changing opinions but we have had conversations on social media before and people who have influence have ended up reaching out to us they tell you ah, i see you do lots of work on fgm can we meet at our office and talk about this and how we can support nous appelons les lieux et les filles, allez-y doucement, faites attention. Non, on refuse, on n'a pas le temps à perdre. It's really important to have this media because it's a conversation starter. I know that there are families that will never sit down their daughters or sons to speak about sexual issues. It just makes everyone very comfortable to start speaking about it because if you don't start the conversation, then no one else will start it. C'est un beau combat qui mérite beaucoup de courage, beaucoup de passion et beaucoup d'amour. L'idée, c'est de le mener par cœur, parce qu'il n'y a pas en fait un combat qu'il faut le plus noble puisque celui que nous sommes en train de mener. Leader politique, leader religieux, personnalité d'influence, on a besoin de vous. Mettez-nous devant, on ne veut plus être que des bénéficiaires, mais on veut être des acteurs de changement. Permettez-moi de vous dire que c'est maintenant ou jamais, car l'heure est grave. Wow. Wow. I know, pretty powerful, right? That's what young people can do. That's yeah. what young people can do. Yes. Sorry, That's I just realized that. my video is not turned on, but I'm so moved by that vid by that film. Yes, I'm so moved too. I mean, it's, it's, it's very powerful, you know. It shows the power of young people. It shows the power of media. It shows the power of having a voice. There are just too many, too many messages in that video. And that will be leading us to the next phase of this um, webinar. So um, now we are open for questions. You can send in your questions to the chat box using your, um, um, putting your name and your location. We need to know where your questions are coming from. So before you send in your question, Make sure you, you put your name, indicate your name, and also your location, where you're asking the questions from. So now I'll be moving to the panel. We have watched this video, okay? What are your thoughts about it? I'm personally moved about it, you know? For, for, for the lady saying, you know, she was caught at the age of eight, got married at 15, she's, she has two girls. I mean, that's, that's so, Ayo, Ayo, tell me, well, let's start with you. What do you think about the video? Well, in one, the, the, in one minute, in one minute. That video really passed a lot of message. It shows the, the trauma. In fact, I can only imagine the trauma she had been through, being caught at eight and getting married at 15. She's still a teenager, so it, it really passed the message and it really touched me. It uh, really touched me. 
Wow, that's nice. Um, Domitla, let's hear from you. What do you think about the video? I think, uh, thank you. I think the video is a bit of uh, the situation. And uh, I, I can uh, say in one word that that video, the power in that video is the change that we are all testing for. It is evident that we got this, that we, we can do this. Because having women survivors coming out that clearly and uh, declaring, you know, and speaking out, sharing their stories, what has happened to them, but rising above what happened to them, and, you know, uh, coming forward to say, we, we have to put this to a stop now or never. That is just evident that actually it can end it here. Exactly, exactly. I agree with you. Mohammed, let's hear from you. What do you think about the video? Yes, I think about the video, uh, it's just um, showing out the power of which young people um, hold to end in FJ. Um, some of the lessons learned during that particular video, as you mentioned earlier, you know, with the scenario and what she explained. You know, it's really awesome. It means that when young people are given the chance to take up their rights and do the things themselves, like what the uh, proverb says, what is, uh, what, what is for us without us is not for us. Like young people taking charge using the media, the end of agency. I think that's what all about this video is showing with mm, some thank critical you. lessons. Thank you very much, well, yes, I agree with you. He has lots of messages like that. Thank you very much, Mohammed. Let's move to the Gambia. How are, what do you have to say about the video? Yes, um, for me, there is a very, very powerful message behind that video, and it reminds me of um, Jaha's promise, um, which happened in the Gambia, um, where she got married as a child and also got mutilated. So um, this story reminds me about her experience and also how collective efforts can help us fight against FGM, especially the media. So I think um, it's very much powerful. And at some point I felt emotional because seeing young people like myself taking charge of the future and campaigning against female genital mutilation is something that is very much dear to my heart. So thank you. Okay, nice, thank you. So Jeremiah, I would like to hear from you because one, you're in the documentary and um, you know, it, it, it has actually given us some insight into the community you work, and I must say you're doing lots of amazing job. So I also want you to tell us, what do you think about the video? Besides the fact that you're in the video, what do you think about the message you're, you're passing across and, you know, the entire message? What, what do you think about it? Uh, the video reminds me of the power of media in regards to bringing us or bringing uh, into attention things that are often um, neglected or are not, are not looked into. Um, within, within five minutes, you are able to convince someone that this is actually an issue that we should look into. So all the time, when I look at um, videos, uh, footage taken from the ground and put together to communicate a specific message, it just reminds, it just reminds me of uh, the ability of us to use the media to expand and move faster in ending FGM. So yeah, technically that's it. Okay, thank you very much, Jeremiah. That's that's amazing. So now we're going to move on to the next phase. I think we have some comments from some people concerning the video. Um, we have one, it says, um, this is a very inspiring and insightful video. We have another comment from Dr. Wilbur Foss Oti from um, Abakaliki, Ebo in State, Nigeria. And it says, the video revealed deeper wound survivors are carrying within them. I see the fire in the young people and I'm positive that the future of NFGM lies in their hands. Okay, we are going to move into the questions later. So I know there are lots of um, comments like that and um, I agree with everyone's opinion. That video is very, very powerful. And um, I'm sure you should be able to have access to the video when you join our Facebook group. You should check it there. There are lots of videos and lots of things to inspire our work you know, to keep campaigning against female genital mutilation. So now we are going to delve into questions and approaches that can help us as young campaigners. So everyone, you can now send in your question. This is like the eye water mark. This is the main, you know, part of the webinar. So I'm going to start with some questions that 
I have now for the panelists. So I tell me well, I'm going to start with you. Sorry, because in my cam my 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 screen, you're number one. So <laughs> let's start that way. So I hope okay. I'm not casting you nowhere. Yes. Yeah, so what is it like being a young campaigner against FGM in your community? In one minute, please, because there are lots of questions. So what is what does it feel like being a young um, FGM campaigner in your community? Well, as exciting as it might be, being a young campaigner, it's also tasking and challenging because uh, my state uh, is a place where young people don't really get the voice. But thank God for the, uh, we are grateful for the narrative is changing gradually and it's about the approach. So it's exciting and tasking and challenging at the same time. Mm, I can imagine. So let's move to our from the Gambia. Awa, when you're introducing yourself and from your contribution so far, I notice you're always saying collective efforts, collective efforts, collective efforts. I think that's your selling point. So tell us, what does it feel like you're 21? What does it feel like being a young campaigner from the Gambia? You know, your community is unique to mine. So I'd like to know. Yes, um, I say though, um, I always like to say collective efforts because I believe in ending violence against women, especially when it comes to FGM and child marriage, there has to be collective efforts in as much as there are laws in place or there are a lot of mechanisms to help um, curb these issues. If we don't collectively fight it together, especially us, the young people, it's going to be very hard to get to the um, um, NFGM by 2030 agenda. So. For me, it's it's always a collective effort. No matter what you what you can do, even if it's very little, you you always have um, a contribution point. Um, so being a young activist in the Gambia, it's um, just just like Ayo 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 Towim Ayo Tomiwa. I cannot really um, pronounce your name very well. Just like she said, um, it's very very much fulfilling, but also it comes with a lot of challenges because. Um, I'm a young person and sometimes we reach out to certain communities where you would have to talk to people that are way older than you. And just because of your age, they think you don't know, you don't yes. know a lot. We are going to yeah. come to that. We are going to talk about how young campaigners deal with elderly persons. So don't yeah. worry, we're definitely going to come there. <laughs> exactly. but Mohammed, let's Thank come you. to you. How does it feel being a young campaigner from the Gam yeah, from Sierra Leone? Sorry, <laughs> I wanted to give you another citizenship. <laughs> So how does it feel being a young campaigner, being a student journalist? Share with us in one minute. Yeah, I feel like my dream come true, um, being a young campaigner by taking the bull by the horns, going out, speaking issues that has to deal with young people, especially when I've sought, um, you know, some of the dangers of course in my society, make it, have been happened. So me having um, short ideas and being part of this particular campaign, I think before the end of 2030, James, you know, this my dream uh, actualized. And the end of GM is here. With me, I have a voice with a pen and a microphone I'm using. I think to go along with it for me. Okay, okay, Mohammed, thank you very much. So Domitla, let me come to you. I think you, you already answered this question in your introduction. You already talked about yourself and then um, um, how it feels to be a campaigner because your introduction, there was a way you packaged it and you had all of that. So I would be asking you now that could you share example of some of the backlash you have experienced, you know, as a young campaigner in your community? You know, just tell us some of the backlash you have encountered and how you have, ex and how you were able to handle it. Thank you so much. Um, there have been a number of backlash. There have been a number of uh, uh, battles I've had to fight as a young campaigner in the community. And among them, uh, uh, mostly maybe social media, social media uh, battles, uh, whereby people try to or tend to attack you directly because of the role that you're playing in the community. Because uh, this comes from uh, people who feel that you are a threat because you are you are taking up spaces that uh, they didn't do it, so they start that sort that sort of um, threat that uh, people feel. Uh, you know, who is this lady? You know, that kind of question. Who is she? Who does she think she is? You know, why is she coming out? Why is she being recognized? Why is she uh, having all the attention? So, and and according to me, I don't even take that as a as a backlash or a negative attack because uh, it means I'm, uh, my campaign or the visibility of what I'm doing 
is a uh, is is plastered all over the space. So uh, that's that's the kind of direct um, backlash that we face as young campaigners. And of course, uh, the challenges we also get from the community in terms of uh, uh, people not believing that a young woman like myself can speak in front of uh, elders. But the moment, uh, that is the way I've been able to uh, to deal with that, the moment I speak, because sometimes people undermine me, because if you can look at me, I'm not like that big body. <laughs> so the moment people the moment people look at you and they kind of try to undermine you before you speak, but the moment I hold that microphone and I speak to them with respect and dignity, and uh, by the time I'm, I'm finishing that uh, discussion or that dialogue with them, they'll be clapping and they'll be saying, they'll not be seeing you as a child, or a, a disrespectful woman, young woman, but they did see you as a as an agent of change. So yeah. Wow. Thank you very much. I think I think that's actually a common challenge we have, and I'm happy that you mentioned the word respect and dignity. Those are some of the um, values that young activists, the fact that you're creating change doesn't mean you go into the community to talk to them like you just brought them together. So even if they are wrong, we must understand that we have to use the do no harm principle. And then um, we also need to accord them respect, especially in Africa. You know, respect is something that is that that is in our fabric. So regardless of education or whatever level of exposure, respect is an ingredient that we should not lose. So Jeremiah. I have two questions for you. I want to ask, same question, how do you cope with, with the backlash? And then um, from the video, because I'm still attached to the video, you know, it shows a lot and it reveals your influence in the community. So also being a man working to end FGM, how do you cope? How are you coping? Um, first of all, there are two things, uh, sides of the coin. First of all, um, it's an exciting thing. And again, um, is sometimes um, really difficult uh, because you're beginning a conversation that's uncomfortable among a community that um, has been practicing for a long time. So definitely people have different opinions which make you sometimes very uncomfortable and sometimes not very safe um, while, while trying to just uh, spread the message. Um, exciting because now it gives us an opportunity to um, explore and know that, okay, things can change in this community. And so people are able to look at the alternatives that um, you can discuss and, and, and look at the possibilities that actually can, um, you know, better the community. Um, how I deal with that is really contextual, depending on what situation it is, but generally I think involving the people themselves and letting them speak and see that they, that they need to change themselves. Because uh, for a long time we've had situations where um, I felt like I had the solutions, but really I realized that even though I thought that I had the light, then someone else would explain that better and other people listen better. So. Uh, contextual, but I think involving the people is the best way to do it. Oh, nice. You know, so your lean emphasis on lean, leveraging on the people, collective yeah. efforts, like our says, you know, you can't do it on your own. You have to, you know, connect with other people, particularly those in the community. You know, it gives them some sense of ownership when you push them forward and, and make them frontliners in the campaign. That's actually very nice. So let's move to Ayo Tomiwa. I would like to ask, because in your introduction, you were talking about how you, you work with stakeholders in your community, in the Kitty State. So I'd like to know, which of the stakeholders do you find um, easily accessible, or which of them can you say has been very instrumental to your, to your, to your work, advocacy journey? Is it more of traditional rulers? Is it more of religious leaders? You know, So who are those stakeholders that you can advise young activists to say, okay, you're a young campaigner, you want to start advocacy, this is the first place to go. You can see that their support and compassion. So who are those stakeholders? Can you identify them? Yes, the, the major stakeholders that have been helpful so far are the traditional rulers. Oh, because nice. in Africa, in a case people listen more to their traditional rulers because they see them as semi-god in court. So where, what I've been trying to do is to leverage on this belief and go straight to the traditional rulers first. Most of our activities, I go to the traditional rulers, let them, I let them own the project. I let them own the activity and tell them this is what we need to do. So they will in turn have the message to their people. Then we leverage more on the media platform. 
because the media, whether you like it or not, even though you are in the grassroots as the insolent, media gets to them. So this helps us get the attention of the decision makers, the people in power. And this has been helpful because in science, in the last two years, there's been several laws that have been passed in the states. That's the GBV law, um, the enactment of different laws have come to place. And this is because the awareness rate through the media platform. So as a young media advocate, the first point of call I would advise is recognize your traditional and community leaders, work with them, let them identify the project, let them identify with the project. Then the media platform is a very fantastic platform to use. So what we do mostly is um, to work with the media outfits and give them this sense of ownership, let them buy into it. The message, and they will be the one to run with the message and to make your work a lot easier. Oh, nice. Thank you very much. I think that that should also apply to other communities. As much as we are media campaigners and we know that the, the media is a very powerful tool, we should not underestimate the power of traditional rulers. So for young campaigners watching, you must understand that female genital mutilation is a cultural practice and you cannot end it in your community without the support of your traditional rulers. Many of us think our traditional rulers are not accessible. You can just start by writing a letter, reaching out to them, and you'll be amazed at the change you can make within your community with that step. So let's move to Mohammed. Mohammed, can you hear me? So I'm going to ask you the same question. Uh, I can hear you. Yes, I'm going to ask you the same question. Who are the stakeholders that have been very instrumental and supportive of your work in Sierra Leone? For the main stakeholders, um, the, uh, the religious people and, of course, the additional um, authorities uh, like local council laws. Um, and, of course, we also have authorities. But most of all, uh, the religious leaders. Um, the religious leaders are here have been listening widely by young people, uh, mm -hmm. healthcare folks, you know, and with the kind of collaborative effort we've been having at this time, each, um, each time that we have, each time like we go to any of the communities, the first point of call is the religious leaders. That is in Sierra Leone here, we have the Christian and the Muslim, and it is so good for us that there is a religious tolerance in Sierra Leone. And those people always work side by side here. Okay. So you put them together. Um, this big one voice, you know, on access some of the chronic and biblical, you know, verses to um, you know, let people know at what really um the Bible and what the Quran says about short practices. That has been helping us so more that collaborative with religious leaders and traditional authorities. And the traditional authorities like the issue which happens. Of course, uh, the you know one that who died in one of the initiation bush. That's one point. You know, so much, and it's been cascaded by those local authorities who were arrested by the police, and now they now um, are coming voluntarily um, to seek um, you know advocates and activists like the likes of us, uh, young people, giving us those. Ideas. This has been happening before and they want to share with us. So we hold them tight, um, those traditional authorities and religious leaders. Those are the main um, people that are using here who have been helping us so much in the fight and FGM. Thank you very much, Mohammed. Yes, that's another dimension. Religious re leaders are also very powerful in our community. And Mohammed said something, hold them tight. So you don't do a community project and then you leave and then maybe when you have access to funding, you come back. You don't use and dump them. You hold them tight. A happy new month text will go a long way. A happy, a happy birthday message will go a long way. Keep the relationship, okay? You don't have to see them every day, but you have to hold them tight. Mohammed 2020, hold them tight. <laughs> <laughs> So we are going to move to our, let's move to the Gambia. And I'm going to be reading some of the questions we have. I think we have questions coming in. Yes. So it says, what are the challenges you face in your work? Okay. 
you know, Madam, collective effort. You've talked about collective effort. I know it's beautiful when you have collective efforts, but what are the challenges despite the collective efforts? What are the challenges you experience? Yes, um, that's a very important question and thank you for asking. Um, there are a variety of challenges, um, of course, with regards to the campaign against FGM, most especially in the Gambia. Um, because the Gambia is a country where also it's mostly dominated by Muslims and a lot of these people believe in their religious leaders. So also the religious leaders, it's not most of them that have really supported the campaign in as much as we have some of them that have supported the campaign. So sometimes when you go to some of these communities and you start talking to them and then someone from the crowd, maybe the Imam or someone that is believed to be very much religious, um, you know, to be a religious leader would just come up and say, but practicing FGM is a religious obligation. So you cannot come to my people and start telling them that FGM is, is a harmful practice and that it's illegal. So um, sometimes it's, it's really hard reaching out to these communities. And um, also um, there are some communities in the Gambia that are very hard to reach. And sometimes we go to communities that um, there has never been sensitizations on FGM. When you talk about FGM, they don't even know what you're talking about. So we, we reach out to all of these communities. And for the first time, having people to um, um, engage them into a conversation on FGM is, is really also very challenging because um, you get to explain what FGM really means and how it affects their health as women and girls. And in that way, it's always, it's always challenging because at the end of the day, it's the same, uh, most of the traditional leaders and the religious leaders would always come and have something to say. And what we always use and tell them is that there's, there's no verse in the Quran that would tell you that FGM is an obligation. And if we as a country in the Gambia is looking up to Saudi Arabia where FGM is not practiced, then I don't know why they would come up and say, female genital mutilation is really a religious obligation. So thank you very much. There are a lot of challenges. Everybody can thank relate you. with that particular challenge. Okay. Mm -hmm. And definitely we all have some communities that are very difficult to penetrate. But for communities like that, one thing I do is to come in from two angles, the medical implications and the legal implications. If the traditional and religious banters are getting too tough for you to handle, what does the law in your country or in your state say? about female genital mutilation. So if there are existing laws, even if there has not been any persecution, you can still use that as a tool to say, okay, fine. I'm not saying this, but the government is saying that if you practice FGM, you're liable to two, two years imprisonment or 200,000 Naira or 200 CDs, fine. Yeah. You understand? So you can also talk about the medical implications to say, okay, fine. You may not want to end FGM, but do you know that FGM can cause excessive bleeding? Do you know FGM can cause? So if the ch it's just a, a way of being, um, um, I, I don't know the word, just to, just to create a safe space so you can go back home, leave the community safe, okay? So you have to know your onions, you have to study well, you have to know the laws and the guidelines that rule that community. So then, Domitla, yeah. let, let me ask you same questions. What 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 are some of the challenges? You know, even when people look up to you to say, okay, Domitla, you're a big girl in Kenya, you're doing so much, you know, we look up to you, we want to be like you. What are still some of the challenges that you face? I think the very first challenge will come from your question, or will just uh, answer to your question, uh, whereby people look up to you. People see you as, a, as, a, as, a, as an answer to their problems. Girls look up to you. You know, they put all their problems and their worries in you. And then the challenge is you don't have the solution to all the challenges that they, they are facing. Because uh, uh, you see, uh, in the communities, being a grassroots organization, being a grassroots activist, uh, the community has so much expectation. The fact that you've come out, you put yourself out there, and you've availed yourself to, to their problems, so they kind of uh, uh, dispose all their challenges or all their expectations in you. But uh, just an individual, being an individual activist, uh, many a times you cannot meet the demands of the community, so it becomes more of like a letdown because uh, they see you as a, as, a, as a solution to the issues. Because when you go, you go to the communities or you go to the villages and talk about ending FGM, so you have to provide alternatives. 
which must most of the time means uh, supporting adult education or just giving a, a maybe uh, an economic uh, activity, providing an economic activity or an income generating activity to the cutters. So sometimes the expectations uh, of uh, a leader, a young leader in the community, uh, in the community, uh, beats what you're able to to provide. So that becomes the first uh, the first challenge that I face as, as an individual or as a youth uh, activist because the capacity uh, of my organization, for example, cannot meet the demands of the community. And uh, another challenge that we also face, being a grassroots of, uh, a grassroots activist, is the fact that uh, the place or the community is so vast. So for me or and my team to be able to I think we lost Domitla, right? No, yes. I think the network is okay. full there. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. So, can I but, come in quickly, Ayo? Sorry, I just wanted to come in quite quickly. I'm obviously enjoying all of the conversations and I'm learning a lot from all of you, so thank you. I just wanted to um, flip it a little bit and let's look at um, opportunities or success stories. Can any of you share, uh, maybe we can, our, or maybe even you, Ayo, any success stories or opportunities for young campaigners who might want to come in and join the FGM campaign but don't know how, any strategies of things that have worked. Um, so it would be really interesting to hear success stories that you can share. Okay, okay. I think let, let's start with um, Ayotomiwa. I think you should be able to share because you are, you are one of the fortunate things that has happened to me to the state. So, ah, share. Well, it's, it's, <laughs> thank you for that. It's just a privilege to be part of this, really. To be. Okay, so some of the success stories recorded so far is that the narrative or the silent culture around FGM is broken. The awareness is out there. People are now more aware that, okay, this is going on. And then you'll be surprised that people don't even know what they do to their child. It's FGM. They just feel, yeah, it's just a normal thing because they don't know. So the ignorance there now, it's really, really reduced and people are getting to know more about FGM. Also in Ekiti State, well, I'm proud to say that because Ekiti is one of the states that really put in weight when it comes to GBV related cases. Just last year, September, the first lady has to facilitate some programs that some cutters in the state had to publicly drop their blades. They came out to drop their blades and denounce doing the profession that they are no longer doing this. So it's a major success story because we didn't just get there in a day. It's a gradual process that over time they've been aware because of the negative impact it's having. And they feel, ah, why should I continue doing this? Also, like six communities last year did public declaration in AKT. That is, um, you have Ilawe, you have Ogotun, we have Efuanlaye. They came out publicly to declare that, okay, in their town, in their villages, no more cutting of their girl child. And there is a law backing this up. So if you are caught, in fact, before the law enforcement even take their, their own role, the, the traditional institution would play their role and make sure they sanction such persons. So it's a major success story for me and the state at large. Also, thank you very much, Ayo. I, 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 there are so many alsos, and I hear yes, you, sister. Also. I hear you. <laughs> I hear you, sister. But I really need to give. Uh, we only have a few more minutes, and I want to give this opportunity to Jeremiah uh, to come in as a as a person who has really um, used media really efficiently and effectively. Uh, what, especially social media, and the, and we haven't touched social media. We've been talking all this time. We have not talked about the power of social media, and I really want to give a few minutes to Jeremiah to maybe speak to that and how he has been able to, or how you have been able to rather use social media effectively um, to you know for your end FGM campaign. All right, thank you very much, Neymar. Uh, what I'd say is uh, generally it's a combination of everything that uh, whatever message you carry on mainstream media, that's on TV, on radio, as well as on on print, that's newspapers, um, should also reflect on your day-to-day -day life, on social media, as well as uh, you in the village. So whatever you do then stands out to be what you stand for. And that really has really helped me um, 
uh, and as uh, as uh, I had already said, some of the challenges that we used to experience before has helped me uh, uh, overcome them because now you have you, people know what you're speaking about. So um, technically, when when you speak about the media and um, you ask what is the most important thing really in making sure that you are successful in your campaigns, I would say uh, the consistency part that I look at being able to stand up and say this is my cause. And if I, if, if I, if I stand for uh, women and girls and uh, young children going to school in an equal way, then uh, people will understand because that's what they talk about consistently. Um, so basically, I don't know if I have answered your question, uh, okay. Naima, but to, to any campaigner that's outside there and wants to, to start off right now, you don't need a ton of things really. You just need to be persistent that you know you're talking about this issue and you, f you follow up on it, you talk about it and let the world know that you are talking about it because um, sometimes we have very impactful conversations at the grassroots level in the house uh, with your parents and with your relatives and it transforms them. But if you go to the media, if you have a conversation with, uh, with, with professionals as well, then you are able to amplify that voice. Before uh, I bring this to a close, let me just say something, Naima. I remember um, while doing the NFGM podcast, for example, I sat down with uh, people from different careers. I sat down with lawyers who are doing pro, pro bono services, for example, for uh, children who are abused and married off when they're young and cut. I, I sat down with uh, someone who's doing programs uh, for uh, community-based organizations. And then you realize that it's just us that limit ourselves really because uh, you don't have to have activism as part of your career in the long run. There's a lot of things you could do as an individual just to make sure that you stand up for something despite it not being your eight to, uh, 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 eight to five job. So uh, generally we have the potential as young people with their internet in our hands, our phones, our computers, those who use the tabs as well. We have so much power in those tools that we carry in our pockets, but how are we using them? So I would urge everyone who's watching this now or even after that they do not they do not despise themselves because they really have the power to influence. And if you have a way to have your voice out, then people will definitely listen. As I bring this to a close now, 100%, um, in the past, especially in my community, for you to speak to a group of elders, you really had to um, go through a process. Right now, there is the opportunity to reach many people in that community by simply recording a video by sending a message, by using social media, because even if they don't have the social media tools like, like phones, then they still have sons and daughters who have them, who often watch with them. So let's not despise our efforts. There's a lot of impact we can have when we take up the responsibility and take it boldly. Yeah. Thank you very much, Jeremiah. One thing I learned from what you said is consistency. You can't, you can't preach this and then you're doing something else. One of the things I'm thankful for is when people talk about me, when people say I ability, they just say, oh, FGM, oh, that FGM lady, that lady does one campaign on yeah. me. You know, people can actually okay. identify. So I, I'm, I'm glad, regardless of how they interpret it, at least they get the message. So people must be able to know that this is what you do. So if you want to use your Facebook strictly for your FGM campaigns and then your WhatsApp status for fun, you should be able to also know which social media platform you want to use. And then um, I, I, I agree with everything Jeremiah have said, but I think there's one thing we've been missing out, which is funding. Regardless of how amazing you are as a young activist, you need funding because that money is your voice from logistics to airtime and all of that. And that's why I'm excited to share that UNFPA would be funding some of our media ideas. So if you have your ideas, you can always send them. And um, I'm very thankful because UNFPA is going to be supporting us to reach out to more persons. And I think Naima will be talking more about that. So going forward, um, I would like you panelists to share one advice for every young campaigner watching or aspiring young campaigner watching. So let's start with Mohammed. Mohamed, what's young? What's one advice do you have for aspiring young campaigners? I think um, one advice I have for aspiring young campaigners out there, I've been far on this to this level 
with the effort of collaboration, the collaborative efforts. When you want to take up something, you collaborate with your community leaders. Sometimes you have to use some kind of methods, the source one, um, to gain them to your own side. So you don't need to um, start from the hard, you know, points, hitting them directly. So you start little by little by the time they realize you are there. And that's what I'm doing. Wow, network. Network, yeah. So I think what Mohammed is saying is little by little, you don't just go to the community and bombard oh, them. them time. You know, before this time, you know, um, but as of now, as I was being changed, everyone is so curious now when once I want some community engagement to so listen to me because I give them the respect, I will collaborate with them, and I work with them. They feel like doing it. And they, they see the need now that, yes, we have to change from our old beliefs to ending this one. So this, I want your campaigners to be doing so that we have a successful end of FGM. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Mohamed. Awa, let's hear from you. Yes, um, one advice I would give is to, um, especially to young women, is to stay grounded in their fight and in their voice because um, they know exactly why they're fighting um, towards um, ending FGM in a generation. So um, there's always going to be challenges and all of that, but they need to stay grounded and know why they're fighting for this cause. And also to know that um, if challenges come up, you, you always need to be respectful and be calm when dealing with it. As an activist, that is, um, that, that has been some of the ways I've used to actually get where I am today. So it's it's not always easy, but always be grounded and know what you're fighting for and know that you will surely get there. The future is bright. Thank you very much, Awa. Domitla, let's hear from you. One advice. Uh, my advice to any aspiring or young campaigner out there is this. Please believe in what you believe in yourself. Don't ever doubt, uh, don't ever doubt what you put yourself into. We are here, we have been here, and uh, I want to encourage them also that uh, as much as the, the effort or the, uh, the, the journey might be an uphill task, but it's very rewarding. Every step of the way counts. And because your contribution and my contribution will eventually bring the, 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 the change that we all desire. And one um, big advice that I want to give to any, anybody watching this, uh, this uh, call today, and uh, thinking of in, in getting involved in the campaign to eradicate FGM. The best way we can coordinate all our voices as campaigners to end FGM and bring, uh, bring and put our, all our girls in the space where they deserve is to use media. Let's utilize the power of media. This, for example, just imagine with COVID now, we didn't have media. With COVID, we didn't have media, we didn't have social media. There will be no way that we all could be engaging today. So let's utilize the power of media, whether it is Facebook, whether it is Twitter, whether it is a WhatsApp, any any available media channel. Let's utilize it and then make sure that our voices are heard because that is the only way we can achieve this. Otherwise, this is our generation. I try, I, I like us telling young people that this is this is our space. You see, this is our space, this is our generation. We have the power to decide what we want this, this, this space to look like. So ask yourself this question. So this is your space. How do you want the space to look like? Do you want it to be safe? Because today will never be tomorrow. Tomorrow will never be today. So we yes. must stand up for this. Thank you. Today will never be tomorrow. Tomorrow will never be today. Hmm. Domitla 2020. Ayotomua, so let's hear from you. <laughs> Okay, my advice to aspiring young advocates is that identify a cause. We belong to a generation where we want to do everything because we have so much energy in us. But you need to identify a major cause per time, learn what works in fighting this cause, then understand the strategy, lay out your strategy, what and what you need to do, what do you need to achieve. Then you follow through, speak to it, be known for it. Then understand the peculiarity of each domain and what and what at each phase of this course you're fighting for. The media is so powerful that it reaches even where you think it won't get to. It reaches the decision maker, it reaches people even in the grassroots. So this is what I will advise you as a young person if you're aspiring to be an advocate. Identify your course. What do you want to do? What do you want to achieve? What are the strategies? Then learn 
the strategies from people that have been in that field. Well, I'm sure with that, we really achieve a good result. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ayo. I agree with you so well. But one thing I would say is we must learn to work together as collaborators and not competitors. As young advocates, there's so much we can do together. And together. partnership is one beautiful tool. You know, we understand that um, um, as campaigners, we have challenges, particularly when it comes to funding. You may not have access to funding all the time, but you can always partner with someone that has funding. And don't be scared or shy to ask questions, okay? There's nothing to be shy about. There's nothing to be, to be arrogant about. How did you do this? How did you successfully do this in your community? Have um, friends who are young campaigners as well, because iron sharpens iron. You can ask questions and they'll be able to help you. We can't take all the questions right now, but we've got some compliments. Thank you very much. I can see from Dr. Christopher, he's saying well done. And um, thank you very much, Dr. Christopher Ugu. He's always commenting on our Facebook and our webinars. I, I recognize you. Thank you very much, sir. So we also have the survey, like I mentioned earlier, and I also mentioned earlier, it is very important that you fill in the survey form so that we can get your feedback. So now I would be um, handing over to Naima. Thank you very much, Ayo. Uh, so I heard a lot about funding, 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 and of course funding is the most important aspect to, uh, to continue your work and to amplify your work. Uh, so as the Global Media Campaign, we have, small, with the uh, partnership of UNFPA, we have uh, small micro grants called Direct Action Grants that so you can access by joining our Facebook group. Um, basically, there'll be regular calls for proposals from, uh, from us to kind of invite all the campaigners uh, who are located in Nigeria, Gambia, Kenya, Samoa, Malia, Mali, Guinea, and Ethiopia, as well as Sierra Leone, to apply. Uh, so there will be a lot of information already on that in the Facebook group, so we invite you all to join. And um, so that's to cover the whole funding thing. So I really urge you all to come on that, come to our Facebook group for more information on funding. But um, but that's it for today, unfortunately. For uh, thank you for all a huge. First of all, I want to say a huge thank you to the amazing panelists and my brilliant co-host. You all inspire me. Thank you for joining us today. And uh, again, I'd like to thank our sponsor, UNFPA, for supporting these really insightful webinars. I'm really learning a lot and I'm hoping you are too. We are gonna take a short break for the summer, but for my Somali people, there will be another Somali special webinar coming soon. Uh, more will be revealed very shortly. Um, in the inbox, you'll find, as I said, a short two minute survey. Uh, please fill it out so we can improve our survey. Sorry, we can improve our services for you. And, um, and I think that's it. Um, just to kind of, first of all, say thank you for everyone. And thank you all speakers. Uh, and Ayo, you've been fantastic. <laughs> Thank you very much, Naima. Thank you, Maggie. Thank you to the entire GMC team. And of course, thank, thank you to all of our sponsors and to all our participants, particularly first-time participants. Thank you for tuning in. We're going to communicate, you know, the next, um, um, the information about the next webinar. But please join our Facebook group. There are lots of information there that you don't want to miss out on. So please, if you know anyone that hasn't joined that needs to be here, please don't be selfish with this knowledge, with this amazing opportunity share it with them learn to share learn to share thank you very much no worries thank you everybody yeah. can i thanks everybody take care stay safe keep everybody stay safe yeah stay safe <laughs> thank you bye so much. All right. I'm, bye. I'm grateful thank you all thank bye, you bye mohammed thank you bye uh, thank you Naima. Bye, bye, Naima. thank you mm. Can I ask all